Hello, Web Shadowers. Thank you all for attending our session today. This afternoon, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Harkin, who will be teaching us about cardiology. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of this video at the end. With that being said, Dr. Harkin, you may start whenever you're ready. Great. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so excited that everyone's really interested in cardiology and wants to hear more about being a cardiologist. So um, I have a case for you guys today, but I wanted to first start with um, just some basics about how to become a cardiologist and um, a briefly kind of my path there and how I got there. So um, let's get started. So basically, so I'm a, what's called a non-invasive cardiologist, which is essentially a um, cardiologist that does not do um, invasive procedures. Um, so um, the pathway to getting there is um, after medical school, you apply for internal medicine residency um, and you complete three years of that. Um, and then you apply for a fellowship in cardiology and that's three years. Um, so, and then upon completion of your cardiology fellowship, at that point, you're sort of considered a, a non-invasive cardiologist. Um, and then you um, can decide to become a more specialized cardiologist. So um, an invasive cardiologist um, uh, is someone who performs catheterization procedures and puts stents and things like that. So that's an additional fellowship. There's also additional fellowships that you can do in electrophysiology, um, which is the study obviously of the electrophysiology conduction system within the heart. Um, and there's procedures involved in that as well. Uh, pacemakers, um, uh, atrial fibrillation ablations, things like that. Um, there's also advanced heart failure fellowships. Um, so working closely with individuals who require transplants or um, assistive devices like LVADs. Um, so there's tons of congenital heart disease. I mean, there's tons of things you can super, super subspecialize in. Um, I decided to become more of a preventive cardiologist. Um, which is essentially someone who really focuses on um, both primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Um, primary prevention of, of heart disease is essentially individuals who do not yet have established heart disease and you're trying to prevent um, heart attacks and strokes in those individuals. Often those, I work with people who have a strong family history of heart disease, um, inherited cholesterol disorders, or um, other risk factors for heart disease. And then secondary prevention is essentially um, trying to prevent further events in people who've had heart attacks and strokes previously, and those individuals are obviously at very high risk. Um, and so we use, in preventive cardiology, we use a combination of um, aggressive lifestyle measures as well as medications to prevent cardiovascular disease. So I'm boarded in internal medicine, um, cardiovascular disease, echocardiography, and nuclear cardiology. That's sort of standard for a cardiologist. Um, so I interpret and perform um, stress tests, echoes. Um, I know how to, I interpret Holters, um, cardiac, other cardiac monitors, things like that. Obviously, lots of EKGs. Um, and then I actually did end up going on to do um, something called clinical lipidology, um, which is the study of cholesterol management. So I tend to see a lot of people with sort of complex cholesterol disorders um, that are inherited or otherwise. Um, so that's sort of me, uh, or that sort of cardiology. And then my path was um, fairly straightforward. I went to a um, undergraduate at Pomona College, which is a liberal arts school. Um, I actually took two years off. That was sort of the only deviation in between um, uh, undergrad and residency um, to work and live in Los Angeles. Um, I was a clinical research coordinator at a Kaiser. Um, actually was doing oncology work at the time. I had no idea I wanted to be a cardiologist, um, but knew I just wanted a little bit of time before um, I went into residency um, and then did the rest of my training on the East Coast. So I was at um, Columbia for internal medicine residency and then NYU for fellowship. Um, since uh, finishing fellowship about five years ago, I've been in, in private practice um, in Manhattan um, and, and New York. Um, and I can tell you guys more about sort of the differences between academics and private practices later if that's of interest. Um, but for me, I knew, to, knew I needed um, definitely something that would offer a little bit of work-life balance. Um, I've got three small kids um, and uh, definitely doing it all is, is doable, but it's a lot of work. Um, so that's sort of me. And then I recently moved to San Francisco. Um, 
with my family um, for my husband's job and have decided to start doing a lot of preventive cardiology um, via telemedicine. So that's um, what I'm doing right now. I just established my own practice and I'm excited um, and learning tons of stuff that I'd never learned in medical school about how to kind of start and run your own company. Um, so that's me and what I'm doing. Um, so let me get to um, a case for you guys briefly, and then um, I'll pause throughout this case. Um, I wanted to present sort of an interesting case, but kind of something that would bring up a lot of topics that are like bread and butter um, in kind of preventive cardiology. Um, and then we can go from there. And at the end, I'm happy to answer kind of whatever questions you guys may have. Um, so I don't want to spend too, too much on the case, um, but um, just kind of give you a flavor of what's going on. So um, the case is a 36-year-old woman. Um, she has a history just of asthma, which is well-controlled, and she presents to you for just a routine health appointment, um, just a checkup. And on your exam, you find that her blood pressure is 191 over 125. Um, so that's sort of the, the clinical case. Um, this would be sort of the standard history that you would get on the patient. As we said, she only has a history of well-controlled asthma, no surgical history. Her family history is notable for a mother and father that have hypertension, that's important, um, but no other history of early or premature heart disease or sudden cardiac death. In terms of her social history, um, she's an uh, active, fit person and works in, in administration. Um, no, um, she's a non-smoker and no other um, uh, bad habits. In terms of her medications, she just takes um, uh, medications for her asthma. Um, on exam, she is afebrile. Her heart rate um, is borderline tachycardic at 97. She has a severely elevated blood pressure, as we said, of 191 over 125. Um, and her body mass index um, is, is normal. Um, other than that, her exam, this is kind of a standard exam that you would run through. Um, and uh, essentially it's a lot of words saying that everything's normal. In terms of her laboratory data, so I don't know how much exposure you guys have had to labs and things like that at this point um, over these shadowing presentations, but um, I don't want to, again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just to kind of get you exposed to what a standard um, sort of uh, lab testing would be. Um, over there on the left, you have um, kind of the, the standard blood counts. So you, um, the 11.5 stands for the white blood cell count. Um, the 13.9 is the hemoglobin, which is how much um, red blood cells you have. And then the 411 is the platelets. Um, and then, sorry, I'm just seeing some of these questions. And then um, in terms of the, then the over onto the right, you see all the electrolytes and things like that. The one, the number that's in bold that's abnormal is 129 and that's for sugar levels. Um, the other things that are of note that are abnormal down here at the bottom right, you see the AST and ALT, that's a sign of your liver, how your liver is doing. Um, and those are mildly elevated as well, meaning in, there might be some amount of liver damage. Um, okay, so again, I don't have time to go over how to read an EKG, but I just wanted you guys to see it since I'm a cardiologist. Um, but it, it's a pretty normal EKG for the most part. And again, if there's questions at the end about how to kind of start going about learning EKGs, um, we can do that. But I didn't think that was maybe the best use of our time. Um, but essentially an EKG is um, uh, and how the electrical activity of the heart is. Um, this is what's called a standard 12 lead. Um, and it actually tells us a fair amount of things about, about the heart. Um, you can interpret the rate of the heart, which means how fast it's going, um, the rhythm, which is, is this coming from the normal pacemaker, the sinus node in the heart, or is it abnormal, um, which would be an arrhythmia. So coming from somewhere else in the heart, a common arrhythmia would be something like atrial fibrillation. Um, and then it also can tell us different patterns that we see can be um, signs of either electrolyte disturbances, um, strain on the heart, um, or, or other things like that. Um, so it's um, you guys will end up reading tons and tons of these, um, particularly if you decide to go into cardiology um, and learn all the nuances involved. Um, Importantly, they're not perfect. They can definitely be suggestive of things, um, but, but things can get missed. So 
I wanted to stop there and kind of see if there's any thoughts and questions, feelings, emotions um, at this point. Um, so what we have is a 36 year old woman um, who has asthma. She has markedly um, elevated blood pressure just on routine screening exam. And so I kind of just wanted to see what you guys wanted um, to, what your thoughts were at this point. Um, thoughts, feelings, emotions, questions, or if I should just move on. Let's see. So, so far what we have, so some of these, um, so, so far, lots of questions about being a cardiologist. Awesome. I love all these. Um, so, um, so the leads in terms of the, um, questions about cardiology and cardiologists, let's hold all those till the end a little bit. Um, and let's, we'll just focus on the case at this point. Um, and I'll just focus on some of these questions right now. Okay, so a couple questions about EKGs. Um, so the leads that are done, um, essentially what we have is a, um, uh, there's, it's called a 12 lead EKG. Um, your tech actually will end up doing it for you, but essentially we have what's called limb leads and precordial leads. So you have limb leads, which go on all the, the both arms, both legs, um, and across the precordium. Um, and um, you hook them up kind of in a standard fashion. Um, and so it's all based on, on axes. Um, and in that, um, because it's standardized, you can then see which direction the electrical forces are, are moving. Um, EKGs are done for pretty much every patient um, that's brought in, certainly every patient in cardiology. Um, and um, uh, definitely anyone that's having any symptoms like chest pain, shortness of breath, anything like that. Um, uh, they're pretty standard in, in, in most offices. Um, certainly with any, any symptoms, they should definitely be done. Um, and then we get them routinely in all of our cardiology patients because, um, you know, we're screening for, um, for rhythm issues or, or signs of, of heart strain or stress. Um, okay. So a couple questions before we move on, um, are there any other factors that make, when is it? Okay. Does she normally take blood pressure medicines? Good question. So she doesn't usually take anything um, to manage her blood pressure. This is a very new finding. Um, and she's quite young, right? She's 36. So we wouldn't expect her to have such a high, high blood pressure. Um, and so some people are questioning, maybe this is something genetic. Um, and that's a, a good thought. Um, let's see how likely or unlikely that might be. Okay, so um, let's talk about high blood pressure. So about 50 million or more Americans have hypertension or high blood pressure. About 95% of those people will have something called essential hypertension, which is essentially just run of the mill high blood pressure. And that sort of captures the um, high blood pressure that's the result of age, genetics, um, and, and to a certain extent, kind of lifestyle. Um, and so um, there's something, there's this entity called secondary hypertension, which is sort of what I was getting at with this other, uh, with this patient, um, which is a type of high blood pressure that we just don't think is kind of that run of the mill type. Um, it's not cost effective um, to perform a complete evaluation for secondary hypertension in every patient um, who has high blood pressure. Um, so as a clinician, it's your job to work through, okay, is this kind of run of the mill stuff um, or is this something that really um, deserves further workup? Um, and so there's specific criteria or indications that you should start thinking that hmm, maybe there's something else going on. Um, and that includes um, age less than 30 years um, with no other risk factors, um, history, physical exam or initial lab data that suggests some sort of other um, in etiology. Um, resistant to drug therapy. So what that means is someone who has not achieving their blood pressure goal um, while adherent to the full doses of three um, uh, drug regimen. Um, severe hypertension, which is defined as anything greater than 180 systolic over 120 diastolic. Um, and then an acute rise in a blood pressure, um, of blood pressure in a patient who, who otherwise had stable um, values. So um, our patient um, in this scenario would definitely meet the criteria of secondary hypertension. She has severe hypertension um, and really no other risk factors um, that would make us um, think that she would have run of the mill high blood pressure other than her family history of having hypertension. 
Um, but again, a family history of hypertension, unless it's um, at, at a young age, typically, um, uh, you know, that goes into kind of the essential hypertension diagnosis. They, it's not usually young people that present with dramatically high blood pressure, um, you know, kind of at a young, young age. So um, this slide helps us think about different causes um, of what's called secondary hypertension. Um, so a couple things I just wanted to bring your attention to that you'll be more likely to see um, and things that in some cases you should, should consider in all patients. So one of the most common causes of secondary hypertension is something called renovascular hypertension. What that means is that it's an interplay between the kidneys, specifically the vasculature of the kidneys, causing high blood pressure. Often that's something called renal artery stenosis, which is um, typically in older people in which the um, arteries um, that lead to the kidneys have blockages or plaque in them, um, which causes decreased perfusion to the kidneys and then results um, and damage the kidneys and, and higher blood pressure. Um, we also um, see, um, can see that in different vascular disorders in, in younger people. Um, and it may be, it's, we think it's the most common cause of secondary hypertension. Um, the other couple cases or a couple um, causes I wanted to draw your attention to was particularly drug related. Um, so this is something that in all patients you see with high blood pressure, you should certainly think about and screen for. Um, so common causes are high doses of NSAIDs, which is like ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, um, birth control pills. Certainly, if you see that in a young woman, um, think birth control pills. I've um, switched more than I can count um, women, young women um, who've presented to me with, with high blood pressure because of, of birth control. And so you just switch them to kind of a non-hormonal um, birth control method. Um, certainly a lot of illicit medications, cocaine, anabolic steroids, things like that. Um, also lots of high doses of like decongestants and other sympathomimetics, um, weight loss medications. Um, and then there's some diet, dietary supplements, particularly anything with ephedra in it. Um, and then true story, large quantities of black licorice. This is a common board question. And I actually saw it in practice in one case. And so now I ask everybody, all my patients look at me like I'm crazy, but I legitimately had a patient who I asked that question to, and she's like, oh my God, I just started buying in bulk black licorice off Amazon and consuming it. And once she stopped the black licorice, um, her blood pressure went down. So that's another one to just keep in the back of your mind. It's a, it's a very common board question as well. And then sleep apnea is another big one. Um, it's increasingly common um, and certainly um, really, really important to screen for. Um, so anyone who has a classic thick neck or a large abdomen, um, certainly screen them for it. Um, there's different mnemonics you can use and questionnaires, um, but also we see it in, in people who you wouldn't anticipate and that's just an anatomic um, thing within their kind of their mouth and their neck. Um, so definitely screen people. Um, classic um, symptoms are obviously snoring or their bed partner says that they stop breathing at night uh, or gasping for air, waking up in the middle of the night frequently and not knowing why, um, morning headaches, extreme fatigue in the day, despite a good rest, that sort of thing. When in doubt, um, there's easy tests now that you can do at home um, that are great. Um, so that's another one um, that you'll see kind of in your clinic, kind of no matter what field you go into. Okay. So getting back to our, pet, our patient, I withheld some information from you. Um, not only does she have sudden onset severe hypertension, but she's also been experiencing some headaches and palpitations, some lightheadedness. That's what presynca B means, kind of feeling like you're going to pass out, but not quite passing out for the last couple of months. Um, so um, anything that would make you, do any of these symptoms suggest any particular diagnosis to any of you guys or anyone else have any questions at this point or ideas of what other tests you might order? And while I wait for any of those questions to come in, I'll just start addressing some of these other ones about um, being a cardiologist. So have you found that one cardiologist? Um, Great question. So in terms of job search, I wouldn't think about invasive versus non-invasive, which is more um, employable. Um, that was the question was whether it was when looking for jobs, are, are people more interested in invasive versus non-invasive cardiologists? So they're totally different job sets. 
Um, so they'll be, when you start looking for, for jobs, you'll look for jobs that apply to, to you and your training. Um, and there's tons of need for, for both types. So I would really think about kind of what is more interesting to you. Um, and that might change as time goes on. I certainly was drawn to cardiology, not only because of kind of the immense impact that you can have on patients, um, just because of the, the prevalence, obviously, of cardiovascular disease, but also the procedures. I really liked them. I was good at them. I enjoyed them. Um, and then over time, um, you know, you, you get to do these procedures throughout residency and training. Um, and then over time you figure out, is this something I want to do like my whole life? Um, and there's tons of people that that is the answer. Like they just love it so much. And for other people, I, um, I sort of, you know, I enjoy doing them and, and I still um, think they're, you know, really exciting. And there's that um, impact factor in, in the sense that you can you know, fix something right away, right? Like putting in a pacemaker or putting a stent in, make people feel better like immediately, which is really gratifying. Um, but for me, um, I decided, you know, I, I had experienced enough of that and that wasn't kind of my primary passion. Um, it's also, there are some lifestyle factors at play. Certainly if you're an invasive cardiologist, you're on STEMI call. Um, so, so, and it's a rotating schedule, but um, it certainly um, requires you to be on call more, um, and, and and be readily available at the hospital, um, which is totally doable um, with younger kids, but it just, I think also depends on, on your partner and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, okay, so, um, so we got a couple of questions. So people are asking about sleep apnea. People are asking about um, insulin testing. Um, there's some questions about diabetes and things like that. Um, so, and, people want to know if maybe she's pregnant. Um, all interesting, good questions. Cushing, glucocorticoid excess. All right. Lots of interesting stuff. Okay. Um, wow. All the, all the, all the answers are rolling in. People want an MRI. I wish I could talk to you. What are you looking for with the MRI? There actually is an MRI coming up. Um, all right, cool. So let's see what is next. So I'll give you some lamps. Um, so her thyroid is normal. So people were asking about diabetes. So diabetes in and of itself um, wouldn't cause um, this, this type of high blood pressure. They're often commingled together because of similar sort of um, risk factors and lifestyle choices and things like that. Um, but she does have a, hemo uh, a pre diabetes. So hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of how your glucose is over the last couple of months um, was measured um, and is 6.2, which puts her in um, that pre-diabetic category. Um, and then we did check kind of cortisol, Cushing's type stuff, um, and that was, was within normal limits. Um, and so notably on the right-hand side, we see um, a lot of measures of um, catecholamines, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, dopamine, um, and then the metanephrines. And those are all um, markedly, markedly elevated. Here is your MRI for whoever requested it. Um, so I, I don't know if you were thinking of this diagnosis, but this is what was found. There's a well-circumscribed solid right adrenal mass um, that has um, some mild heterogeneity. Um, and the, the right kidney is normal, um, despite that adrenal mass. So this is just kind of the summary. Um, and the radiologist, given the clinical history that was um, presented to the radiologist, by the way, as a clinician, always share what's, what are the main symptoms, complaints, why you're getting it, because that really aids the radiologist in their interpretation and they can help you out a lot. So don't skip that step. You get, you get crazy and busy and you just want to get your orders in, but don't skip that step. Um, so the radiologist based on the clinical history that was provided to them, um, and the clinical appearance of, of this mass, um, suggested pheochromocytoma as a diagnosis. So let's talk about this. This is one of those zebras. Um, I, this, aside from this case, I have not seen it in clinical practice, but it is tested up and down. And it's one of those things that you will learn um, uh, about. Um, so I just wanted to present this zebra to you briefly. 
So it is a rare um, neuroendocrine tumor um, and it arises from the chromophane cells of the adrenal uh, medulla um, and it's catecholamine secreting, meaning it secretes things like epinephrine and other hormones um, that are involved in our fight or flight response. Um, it's usually diagnosed in the fourth or fifth decade of life. Um, and um, the type of, and it's, and it's a pretty uncommon, as I said, cause of, of high blood pressure. So about, um, we think 0.1 to 0.6% of patients, um, all comers with hypertension. Um, but there is some suggestion that we miss this point a bit, um, as they're found incidentally, um, in, um, in cadavers, um, in individuals who've, who've died of other of causes. Um, so it's something that certainly should be suspected when to suspect it. So this classic triad um, is episodic headache, diaphoresis, which is excessive sweating, and tachycardia, fast heart rate. Um, but most patients aren't going to have all three, but that's going to be the classic triad that you'll get tested on. Um, headache is the most common. Um, and if you do see all three of them, um, the specificity is quite high. So if you see all three together, um, along with kind of se severe hypertension, it's very likely to be pheochromocytoma. Um, almost all patients um, will have uh, hypertension of note. Um, and then there's these other symptoms, which you can read here, palpitations, kind of panicky feeling, weakness, that kind of stuff, orthostatic hypotension, um, which is basically a um, uh, uh, low blood pressure upon, um, upon standing. Um, those are all probably related to the low plasma, um, volume. Um, and then also, um, the indirectly related to the increased, um, catecholamine production. Um, and then interestingly, that's this insulin resistance, diabetes, hyperglycemia that we're seeing is, is directly related to the increased catecholamine production. Um, and most, if not all of these things will resolve, um, once they're surgically resected. This is the other thing to know, this rule of 10, it's actually not, there's been a lot of, um, kind of advances in sort of the diagnosis and the genetics that kind of challenge this traditional rule of 10, but it's really useful to know because you'll definitely get tested on it. Um, so the rule of 10 is that 10% of these are extra adrenal, meaning they're not in the adrenal glands themselves, but somewhere along that paraganglionic chain, in which case they're called paragangliomas. 10% um, are bilateral, meaning they, um, are on both sides. 10% are malignant, um, meaning not just isolated to um, the adrenal gland. And then 10% are thought to be familial. It's probably more than that. Um, and what all that means is just kind of these genetic um, or hereditary causes. There's a classic um, syndrome called MEN, and there's a MEN1, MEN2, MEN3, um, and it is part of MEN2, um, along with thyroid um, cancer and hyperparathyroidism. So, um, so you'll kind of learn all about these different things in, in medical school, um, but suffice it to say, it can occur um, it, genetically. So how do we get um, the diagnosis? Um, so similar to our patient, once you suspect this in the patient, um, you um, can order different um, tests. So we used to, so because the tumor secretes catecholamines, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine, um, we can get, um, uh, we can measure this um, and we can either measure it in the plasma or the urine um, and um, then uh, so we used to get the 24 hour urinary excretion of both total menonephrines and, um, catecholamines. Um, but, um, over the last couple of decades, a uh, plasma free menonephrines, the blood test was developed. Um, uh, there's different, um, reports in terms of sensitivity and specificity, but it's definitely much more convenient than having a patient, um, collect their urine for a full 24 hours. Um, so more off, mo most people most clinicians now use this um, plasma-free um, uh, metanephrine test. There's not a major consensus um, in terms of which one to use, but I would, I, that's definitely the most, um, most common. But um, in terms of the uh, board answer, either one is acceptable as first choices to exclude um, pheochromocytoma. Okay, so getting back to our patient, um, so she was initiated on a preoperative alpha blockade. Um, so essentially, you have to put her on a medication um, to prevent catecholamine-induced um, 
very serious potential life-threatening complications during surgery. Um, so, um, so that you don't get this huge surge as it's being um, removed of these catecholamines. So you suppress it um, and get their blood pressure down, ideally below 160 over 90, um, and their EKG looks okay, and they're not having tons of premature ventricular contractions, which can happen um, and can uh, kind of forewarn you of, of poorer outcomes. Um, so, so you don't go rushing in on this um, to remove it. You definitely get them to a stable place clinically first, and then you send them to surgery. Um, and they, um, uh, she had her uh, rate adrenal mass laparoscopically removed. There were no complications. Um, and then we measured her, all of her um, metanephrines um, and catecholamines after surgery, um, and they all had returned to normal. And her blood pressure and all of her symptoms resolved um, after surgery, and she continues to be followed closely by all of the relative, um, all the involved specialties. So that's sort of my case. Um, so I wanted to kind of give you a case in which um, we sort of thought through. So hypertension is something you will see in in, in like almost all of your patients. Um, and so more often than not, it's it will be a central hypertension, um, in which case, um, depending on how high it is, you work with them on um, lifestyle factors to lower their blood pressure and or medications. Um, uh, but it's always, always, always important to be thinking of some of these other causes. As I said, particularly um, uh, medications, um, alcohol, all that kind of stuff in everybody. And then when you elicit other, if you elicit other symptoms in patients, starting to think about some of these quote unquote zebras, which may or may not be more common and then, then we think they are. Um, so at this point, I just kind of wanted to turn towards um, some of these other questions that I'm sure you have about um, either the case or sort of um, uh, other kind of questions that came up as I presented this case or um, questions about kind of being a cardiologist, um, kind of a typical day in the life of a cardiologist or anything else that, that might be useful to you guys. Um, I think I had like a, oh, one quote that I wanted to end with was just, um, I think my biggest takeaway um, for you guys as someone who's just a couple of years out of, of training is that um, I'm certainly in a very different place um, than I thought I would be. Um, and that um, I think the best advice that I wish I had when I was at your place was to kind of really plan and strategize and figure out what it is you want to do, um, but also um, that you leave space for things to maybe be different um, because you will definitely grow and evolve um, a ton uh, from kind of your teens and, and 20s to um, when once you become a cardiologist. And it's one of those things where it's there's so much time in our training um, that, and these are such critical time in our life in which we're like figuring out life stuff and all kinds of other things. Um, and so, um, so I just keep in mind that, um, different things might become priorities to you. Um, and, and there is a huge, um, movement within sort of, um, the physician community right now about addressing that, um, historical lack of work-life balance, um, and the resultant burnout, um, that is a total buzzword right now, but it is, uh, legitimately incredibly important. Um, and so I think um, ways to kind of think about that is um, one, really figuring out what um, bring gets you excited. Um, it's a long, hard ro road. It's totally worth it. Um, but certainly thinking about what's going to make you excited to get up every day is huge. Um, but also realizing that some of those other things that, that come into play, where you work, who you work with, all of that stuff is also really, really important to your happiness. Um, and so um, just keeping in mind all of those other things that kind of don't sound important, um, but, but ultimately um, are important as you sort of figure out what it is you want to do in, do in life. Um, so that's sort of my, my parting thoughts, but let's get to some of these other questions. Um, okay. Um, so, oh, some questions about the kidneys. So the adrenals are actually the, um, an, an, 
endocrine gland that sits above your kidneys. Um, so the kidneys weren't affected at all. Um, uh, it's like just on top of it. Um, okay, can you go over academic versus private cardiology lifestyle responsibilities? Okay, so, um, so yeah, so um, briefly a non-invasive cardiologist um, typically um, either works in an academic setting or works in private practice. There are some models that are a little bit more of a hybrid at this point, but that's sort of the classic difference. Um, so academic cardiologists, um, not all, but most tend to be more interested in um, both research, either clinical or laboratory research, um, and then also um, in teaching and, and education um, and being part of kind of the, the fellowship um, program. Um, so academic cardiologists, um, there, um, they certainly are expected to typically publish um, and um, be a, a teaching member of the faculty. Um, and so um, different, um, different programs are, are different um, and each person is uh, varies dramatically in terms of their expected responsibilities. Um, uh, but that's kind of a, a typical academic cardiologist. Some are very clinically involved and see lots of patients. Others um, uh, only have a day or maybe less of, of clinical exposure. Um, so it kind of depends if you're really interested in research, that's 100% the right way to go. Or if you're really, really interested in, um, in teaching, um, then, then that's a really um, good route um, uh, so that's sort of the academic part. The private practice part um, is um, typically um, you are either an employee, um, like at somewhere like at Kaiser, um, or you are um, uh, kind of a governing member of the private practice um, and, um, and have some say in sort of how the practice is run, um, hiring and firing, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so private practice cardiology, it, again, also really can vary. Um, there's some really busy private practices in which you are um, either, you're responsible for um, a certain number of RVUs, which is basically how you can account for your time um, and how much you're billing. Um, and so there's definitely some private practice settings where um, it's very important um, how much you get paid is directly tied often to how much you see patients. Um, there's other private practice settings where that's less important. Um, so it can really vary. Um, the typical non-invasive cardiologists will either have kind of their day to day. Um, uh, what I love about it is that you'll end up doing a ton of stuff within a day. Um, and it depends for everybody. It's a little bit differently different, but there's usually lots of, of patients that you see um, in clinic and then um, reading your own patients um, echoes. So in private practice, what's nice is that you kind of are in charge of all of that. So I would, you know, you order patient echoes or stress tests and you supervise and, and or interpret all of those tests uh, on your patients. Um, so Classically in private practice, you have a little bit more control over your schedule as well as um, kind of what your day looks like. Um, in terms of hospital coverage, some practices, um, both academics and um, private practice are using um, kind of inpatient cardiologists like in a hospitalist type model um, to manage their patients on the inpatient. Um, uh, others are still seeing their patients um, when they're admitted to the hospital. Um, so it sort of depends. Um, so some private practice cardiologists, a typical day, they'll start, um, they'll get up pretty early, head to the hospital, see any of their inpatients, then get to the clinic, um, have a busy day of clinic, which typically involves seeing, um, you know, 30 plus patients, um, supervising stress tests, reading echoes, reading um, stress tests, EKGs, holters, um, returning phone calls, looking at labs um, and responding to anything that's urgent. Um, and that's kind of a, a day. It's typically very, very busy and, um, and fun and a lot going on. Um, so that, um, that's kind of a typical um, private practice academic day in the life. Um, in terms of work-life balance, that is um, a really uh, good uh, question. So um, my situation, I got married right when I started fellowship. Um, and then I had my first child at 
the in the last year of fellowship um and um it's difficult but definitely doable um i think with kids there's no great time to have kids um so i think you just have to do what makes sense for your life and make it work um and um uh i will say because I had my uh, kid in fellowship, um, I did have to, you basically use your, your four weeks of vacation as your maternity leave. And then my, I took a, two weeks of my research time as well. Um, so it's not a lot of time off. Um, and then I had to kind of, um, I took two other weeks and then I had to kind of make that up on the end. Um, so, um, so because of GME requirements, um, that's the only thing to consider with within training um, is that you have to have those exact number of hours in order to, to graduate. Um, but you can always, most programs are very accommodating in terms of moving things out. Um, and actually another woman also had a child then. And so we were able to just kind of extend our training a little bit and it worked out great. Um, in terms of for me and what um, prompted my decision to go into private practice is that I, um, I need, I knew I needed to work um, part-time. And this is part of what I was talking about. Like if you had told me that I was gonna look for a part-time position when I was um, probably at your stage, I would have said you're crazy. Um, but that's just what I realized was gonna be the best um, solution for my family. My husband has a even crazier job that required tons of travel. And and so in order to make the, the home life situation work, cause we didn't have any family that lived in New York with us. Um, I chose to, to look for a private pr practice job that was part-time. Um, academic part-time is really, really difficult to come by, um, which is sort of why that decision tree was, was made for me, um, at least at the time when I was looking for, for jobs. Um, so um, I was able to, and it's still difficult. It's not um, uh, certain specialties. Like I think um, uh, some like pediatrics or, you know, there's a couple of specialties where um, you can do a job share or a part-time position that's a little bit more um, feasible or common in cardiology. It's still not super, super common, um, but it's out there. Um, and you just have to, to work a little bit harder for that. Um, but that worked well for me. So I worked four days a week, which is part-time. Um, and, uh, and then I just did home call for my patients. Um, so that was the other thing that was important to me was I just, there was no way for me since I was the only one at home during the week. Um, there was no way that I could, um, rush into the hospital with an infant. So, um, so that's what worked for me. Um, and then I've since COVID made the even bigger transition and I'm now doing, as I said, um, all kind of preventive telemedicine. Um, so, um, so I think, um, just, and, and that's super non-traditional, like, um, so, um, you know, life might take you in, in crazy and different um, places, but I think what's really exciting right now is that there's so many different pathways for physicians. Um, so you can use your MD and so many different ways. Um, and I'll always want to do some clinical practice. Um, but, um, but I'm also looking at other ways that I might end up using, um, using my degree. So, um, you know, there's so much happening right now, um, whether you want to do administration or health tech or whatever it is, there's a lot going on. Um, so, so that's another kind of part as to why I was mentioning, just kind of keeping all doors open and, um, you never know, you know, where you might end up or what you might want to do. Um, so so let's see what other, oh my goodness. Okay. Um, okay. Potential complications. So getting back to the case, um, right. So sustained high blood pressure, certainly increased risk for stroke, cardiomyopathy, um, and, um, and, and, um, all of those kinds of, uh, tip classic complications from elevated high blood pressure. In addition, the sustained catecholamines, um, so uh, would cause a lot of stress on, on the body. And we're increasingly recognizing um, that sort of increased levels of catecholamines and stress is, is really, you know, um, not great in terms of, of heart health um, complications and things like that. So heart attack and things like that, she would be pretty high risk for. Um, that said, as I mentioned earlier, people, this is an in, also an incidental finding. Um, so there are people that die of other causes and then it's, and then it's found. So it's certainly not universally life-threatening. Um, but in this patient, um, it was certainly important to get it, um, removed. Um, 
can the mass metastasize? So good question. In some cases it can. Um, actually, I didn't present the full case. She actually ended up having um, uh, this bilaterally. Um, so um, it, it can um, spread. I don't think we know enough now if some become metastatic um, and others will never become metastatic, um, but it's certainly something that um, can cause enough complications that you want to remove it. Um, so what do you wish someone would have told you in undergrad? Um, so I guess getting back to some of what I've already mentioned, which is that um, is to find something that, to, to realize that this is definitely a long, hard road. Um, you will um, still be in training and owe a lot of money for a long period of time. Um, and you will see some of your other friends in sort of similar type professional careers who, even if they go to say like law school or, um, or, or business school, um, entering the workforce much earlier than you. Um, and they're still working hard, but they're, um, they're definitely compensated for it. Um, and I think um, we definitely, it's hard to kind of take all of that into account um, at, when you're um, in school um, or thinking about going to school. Um, and I definitely don't think it's a reason not to do it. Um, I, I, we need lots of smart people going into medical school. Um, but, you know, I think just I think none of us totally appreciate how much of an impact that will have in terms of, of family planning, um, uh, savings, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, so just making sure that you are, this is, uh, something that you're truly passionate about, um, so that some of these other kind of barriers that will come up along the way, um, you, you'll, you can just be like, well, I know what I want to do and this is, this is worth it. Um, so I think just kind of having a clear idea that those those barriers exist and they will come up um, just helps you be more prepared to kind of deal with them when those come up. Um, hospital or clinical setting. Okay, so that's a really good question. That was another reason I went into private practice was because um, I, um, I actually really like um, preventive medicine um, and that longitudinal um, sort of relationship you have with a patient when um, you see them in clinic and you see them return kind of time and time again. Um, for me, that is what's super rewarding um, is to be able to work with patients um, over months to years and, and see them um, improve or get better or feel better or, or whatever it is. Um, I also really enjoy a lot of lifestyle counseling. Um, that's not classically a part of our training, but should be given that every single guideline. Um, it's the number one first recommendation, like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, et cetera, unless they meet these certain high numbers, in which case you need to start with medications. Um, the universal recommendation is to start with lifestyle modification. So um, there's an art to it. Um, and uh, so definitely if that's of interest to you, um, seek that out um, uh, because there's different sort of motivational interviewing and different techniques that can make you much more effective at helping people make these changes. Um, and, and that to me is super rewarding. I mean, don't get me wrong. I use Medicaid, tons of medications as well. Um, be, but, um, but some of these lifestyle changes, being able to really help people in a longitudinal way is really exciting to me um, and interesting. And I let, I, as I said, similar to kind of the procedures and stuff like that, I really, really liked the hospital setting for a period of time. I enjoyed working in the intensive care unit and really, um, you know, that high intensity making a major impact on critically ill patients is, is really, really rewarding. Um, but but that's where kind of the self-reflection comes in and kind of what, what is it that I want to do long-term? And I'm grateful that I had enough of a sense of myself to know that while I really enjoyed that aspect of it, and that's part of why I got interested in cardiology, it wasn't kind of what I wanted to do long-term um, and that I was more interested in um, sort of helping my patients uh, make these small baby steps that are less exciting, certainly um, in kind of right when you're right in that moment, but are really gratifying kind of moving forward and seeing um, how they can really change and improve and, and help themselves and avoid those super critically um, 
ill situations. Um, so, um, so that um, is kind of that. Um, and then a single mom who's already had a child, um, medical school doable. So yeah, so there's a lot of different situations that'll come up. Um, and I, if this is certain, if this is your passion, I would say then, then do it. It's definitely doable. Um, what's awesome now about kind of like social media and all that stuff is there's more and more doctors that are sharing their stories and their personal journeys um, on social media. Um, I only recently started doing that. Um, but there's tons of trainees as well as early career, um, physicians that are on say like Instagram or wherever else. Um, I think Instagram is a good place if you want to kind of find, there's a couple of, of doctors who are, um, single moms or had, had kids, um, early in training that are on that platform. Um, and that readily sort of share their journeys and their stories and how they did it. Um, that I think would be really helpful, um, for someone who is in a similar situation and contemplating this. Um, so that you can sort of, they're, they're honest about kind of the, the, um, difficulties as well. Um, and so you can sort of one, get inspiration and also then just be prepared to kind of what, for what barriers might come up along the way so that you're ready for them when they happen, um, can be really helpful. Um, but I certainly think that this career path is totally doable for, for anyone with a passion, um, for, for medicine. Um, how do you deal with patients that are upset with a diagnosis? So, um, very good question. So this comes up more often than not. Um, I, uh, patients certainly, particularly if you're delivering bad news can respond in different ways. Some get um, really angry sometimes at you. Um, and uh, others just kind of like shut down. Um, so that's sort of where the art of medicine comes in and learning how to um, empathize with them in a way that um, helps you feel, um, helps them feel um, that you care. And this can get tricky and complicated. Um, I am certainly of the doctor ilk that um, I show my emotions when um, say I'm delivering bad news to a um, family member or something like that um, because I, I just, one, I can't, it just happens. But also I think that patients really appreciate seeing your humanness. Um, so, um, but if it's more like they're upset that you're telling them they need to go on like a statin or something like that, um, it's giving them space to express themselves and sometimes just staying quiet for a while, um, validating their feelings. Um, I totally hear you. It sucks. And then, um, and then also education. Um, so I'm really, and that's part of why I started my practice was I just really, I spent a lot of time with patients and I like to um, provide that lengthy um, uh, conversation um, that imparts my knowledge, what we know, what we don't know. This is why I, I think this, this is my recommendation and this is why, um, and then help them come to the conclusion themselves. Um, and then, and then just meeting them where they're at. Some patients, um, you know, aren't ready to do X or Y and it's in it, um, it really goes against sort of what you think is in their best interest. Um, so you, you table it, um, and, um, provide more, more reading material. Um, sometimes you, uh, can talk, bring in a family member and say, I totally under, you know, I totally hear what you're coming, where you're coming from. This is a huge decision. Um, let's, is there someone else that you want to kind of bounce this off with that you trust, um, like a family member. And so sometimes I'll get on the phone with their child or their their spouse um, and let them in. And sometimes that person has additional questions that you can answer that kind of helps them. So, so I think helping them feel like it is a joint decision. I mean, definitely gone are the days of like patriarchal, like, you know, this is what you will do uh, medicine. So it's, it's all about that joint um, patient physician um, decision-making um, that can help patients really feel comfortable with um, with their, with, with kind of the, the game plan going forward. Um, okay. And where can we contact you? I think I have that on the next slide. 
There it is. Um, so I am, as I said, I am recently on social media. So I, um, my, I'm most active on Instagram right now. Um, and I, my platform is more of kind of a patient facing platform, but I do, so I don't do a ton of like med ed from like a doctoring perspective. Like I'm not going to go over like how to interpret a swan scan, swan gans catheter, but I do a lot of like, um, more lifestyle. Like what did I just, I just posted on, you know, is calcium supplementation dangerous to heart or not? So I go over kind of some of that data. Um, so I do do a lot of kind of like, um, uh, heart healthy kind of lifestyle, um, education on that platform. So you can follow me there. It's at Nicole Harkin MD. Um, I also have been on clubhouse recently. Um, I'm doing more, um, patient facing stuff there, but there's a virtual grand grand rounds club. That's just been started women in cardiology, um, club that was just started. So I'm, um, plan to be more active there as well. Um, again, maybe a little bit more. Um, oh, and then I'm also part of the, the whole food plant-based club. Um, so we didn't get into this at all, but I do a lot of plant-based and plant forward, um, eating for cardiovascular health. So, um, I do a lot of education on that as well. Um, so that's where I can be found social on social. My email address is also there if you have additional questions. Um, and that's my website for anyone who wants to check it out for, um, uh, just to see kind of what my, my virtual practice is like. Um, uh, there was, I think a couple questions about that, that I didn't even get into, um, for another time, but, uh, but essentially it is, um, I just established a couple months ago. So it is, I'm still in like the proof of concept, um, stage, but essentially I am seeing patients over telemedicine for preventive, um, heart health needs. So I have patients who have family histories or, um, risk factors or established cardiovascular disease and want to prevent further events. I also have patients who have uh, gen genetic dyslipidemias and things like that. So we manage their cholesterol. Um, so trying to utilize the new and exciting world of health tech to help treat our patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Harkin, um, for presenting for our web shadowers. We loved how informative your session was. And thank you so much for answering all of our questions. Um, we learned so much from you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm so excited that I was, I was able to be here. And I think this platform that you guys are doing is so amazing. I wish there had been a resource like this for when I was, um, when I was a, a pre-med because there's just so many different, um, ways to practice medicine now. And there's so many different subspecialties that you never even learn about in medical school. So I'm so glad you guys are getting exposure to all the different specialties and ways you can practice medicine and um, start thinking about these critically important topics of kind of work-life balance and what is it that will make me happy and what do I really want? Because that's so, so important in kind of like your journey. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we definitely learn so much in each session. Um, I'm so glad. That's awesome, you guys. So yeah, reach out if, if there's any further questions. I'm glad I could be here. Um, and then yeah, find me on those social platforms and we can interact further. Everyone, make sure you check out her socials. Her Instagram is Nicole Harkin MD. And um, the link for today's Google form um, has now been posted in the chat box. And it'll be in the description of this video shortly. Please fill it out within the next 30 minutes for us to receive verification of your attendance. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Harkin.